very much. So first I want to recognize Dr. Morganathan, who is uh, our immediate past governor for the Indian chapter. Dr. Morganathan has been lauded a lot by his colleagues there, and I know him personally for the last four years, and I've been thoroughly impressed by all his various activities, talents, and his leadership skills. Additionally, Dr. Morganathan is uh, a newly elected master of the college. To put it in perspective, mastership is the highest honor that the college awards to very select physicians who e exemplify not only the practice of medicine, but the humanistic attributes, leadership, and all the other exemplary qualities that other physicians look up to. We have probably out of 161,000 members around the globe, probably a couple of hundred people who are masters in the college. So Dr. Murganathan is one of the newest masters in the college, so I want to congratulate him on that. I also want to congratulate him because the college is extremely focused on uh, building our international medical graduate community, not only within the United States, but around the globe. So Dr. Murganathan is an exemplary international governor, was uh, among one of two governors who were selected from around the world to be part of an international medical governor task force that has been newly constituted by the college to examine ways in which we can better facilitate the college's offering of academic and other products for international physicians, both around the world and also within the United States. 39% of the US membership in the college are international medical graduates, meaning that they come from around the world and practice in the United States. So that's a significant constituency. And so their needs are significant and their interests are important to the college. And so Dr. Murganandan is only one of two uh, governors from around the globe who've been invited to, uh, head, uh, to work as part of that task force. So I want to congratulate him because he's a highly respected leader in the college and um, his uh, dear work is uh, being recognized when the college invites him to various committees. I also want to compliment Dr. Anuj Maheshwari, our new governor in the chapter. Dr. Maheshwari has continued to demonstrate exemplary leadership, especially during a difficult time where we have not been able to gather together in person as well. So we've all been distant even in our own meetings here in the United States. And so it's even more difficult to connect with our governors around the globe. But Dr. Maheshwari has kept the light burning and kept the chapter active. And so as a college, we are incredibly grateful to him for his leadership and his continued leadership. And I look forward to seeing his continued leadership in the years to come. This is my year as president of the college. Uh, what's the only novelty about this is that I am an international medical graduate. I trained in India before I moved to the United States. And so I'm the first international medical graduate ever to become a president of the American College of Physicians in its 105 year history. I don't consider that a personal accomplishment, but more a testament to the fact that the college is so diverse, it is more inclusive and that we don't recognize our backgrounds or our training, but so much so as the fact that we are all together as one large family. And it's that sentiment that allows me to be here today to join you at your meeting. I wanted to briefly focus on something that is one of the college's priorities. Uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion goes under the acronym JEDI. So not the JEDI from Star Wars that we have all seen in the movie, but really uh, the theme that we want to continue to focus on, which is one of the four strategic priorities of the American College of Physicians. Diversity, equity, and inclusion continues to be a challenge here in the United States and around the globe. Even in India, I'm sure there are lots of different ways that you could focus on, especially uh, we are particularly encouraged that uh, you're focusing on primary care. In fact, yesterday I was at a meeting of the chairs of departments uh, at the university and uh, the conversation came up about India and its primary care and how robust it is and how we need to replicate some of that here in the United States to be able to get grassroots care. 
So I couldn't think of a better uh, theme that you're focusing on this year. And I compliment the organizers for having thought of that as a theme. So for us, it's advancing the diversity, equity, and inclusion in many different ways. And that's what I want to highlight in uh, lots of uh, different aspects to it. So we recognize that even here in the United States, probably one of the wealthiest countries in the world with access to resources, we are guilty of not sharing resources enough with the rest of the world, be it in medical care, in technology, in actual resources and in finances. If the COVID-19 pandemic has not highlighted this equity, then I'm not sure what else should have. We see the new emergence of the Omicron variant and those of us around the world who are concerned about it are not concerned because it's a deadly disease that is going to really overwhelm us, but it's more reflective of the fact that it originated in countries in the world which have still not accomplished significant rates of vaccination and have not been able to control the disease. So South Africa and other countries which have less than 25% of their population vaccinated need to get more vaccine, which is affordable and available to them. And that's the responsibility of us, the more affluent countries in the world in order to achieve global equity. Tony Blair, the former prime minister of the UK, said it best when he said, if virus is anywhere, it will be everywhere. And that is certainly true. And that's what the Omicron variant has taught us. Here in the United States, we face an extreme challenge. The debate that science is not valid. People don't believe us anymore. Physicians who were hailed as heroes a year ago are now villainized because we have continued to advocate for vaccine adoption and for the rational and scientific basis of treatment of COVID-19. We deal with inequities much as the rest of the world deals with. It may be racial inequities, it may be ethnic, or it may be financial, it may be educational, but really what we are looking for is to move towards equity and finally liberation, breaking down those barriers which prevent us from being able to access care equitably for all our patients and our fellow colleagues. And I'm sure in India, you are working hard towards the same thing as well. And I laud you for your efforts and I compliment you. And we are looking to learn from your experience as much as we hope to share some of our challenges. We are also very concerned about gender equity. In 1982, this is what our board of governors looked like, a, a room full of male physicians, many of them white. We are now moving to a diverse population where about a quarter or about a third of our governors are of international descent and background, a number of them from India. More importantly, we have more gender equity with a lot more women physicians because we recognize that women physicians need to be incorporated into our workspace as much as we have had our male physicians who've had that privilege and we need to remove that male domination. <clears throat> our women need equity in the workplace. Our women need equity in promotions, in finding jobs. Most recently, there was a report showing that over a lifetime of work, women physicians earn about $2 million less than their male counterparts for no reason other than that they're women physicians. So we face a serious challenge in terms of our blend of ethnicities, cultures, language, genders, age, a whole variety of hosts which have to interact and which have to homogenize much better for us to be a more collaborative workplace. For all of us, it doesn't matter where we are in the world, our journey began somewhere and we have all reached certain heights. Sitting here and the number of you who have spoken, each of you are such accomplished physicians and I have much to learn from each of you in terms of your experience, your expertise and your wisdom. In my term as president, one of my roles has been to focus on an area of interest that would be relevant to membership in the college, 
And so I write a series of columns once a month, and I focused on inclusivity in particular because it's easier to measure diversity. We can count how many women physicians we have. We can count how many particular ethnicities we have, but we cannot measure inclusivity. It's a feeling, not a quantifiable entity. And so I try to focus on different aspects of how men physicians need to be champions of our women physicians, what I call he for she. We need to be uh, racially equity, which is a huge issue here in the United States, probably less so in India. And then the international medical graduate, which was one of my big areas of focus, recognizing that we are a global community and the college is a global leader. Our presence is in 185 countries around the globe. In the United States, the international medical graduates are predominantly in medicine. Over half of medical graduates in the US are now international medical graduates, not only from India, the largest majority being from India. And what we look for is what is a famous South African concept uh, or African concept of what's called Ubuntu, which means I am because we are in Swahili. And so the story is told of a bunch of children who were uh, offered a race to pick up a basket of sweets, being the first person who would get to there, would get the entire basket. And so when the whistle was blown, the children, rather than race to find to grab the basket, all held hands and ran together to reach the basket and then shared the basket of sweets. It taught a valuable lesson, which is that we are only satisfied or full when all of us are equally satisfied. In other words, we all care for each other and the welfare of all is the most important concept for all of us as colleagues. And so as an organization, as we look at these priority goals, we are trying to align our staff to uh, follow in the same footsteps, our whole vision or our plan as a college as we look to be more diverse be more equitable and be more embracive or inclusive is why our focus so much on our international chapters and the work that you do because we are only whole when you are whole and you are part of us. And so we've broken down our concepts into lots of different things. I won't go into details other than to say this are, these are things that we focus on in a day and two day retreats as we think how do we next position ourselves to be a relevant organization and to be relevant to patients as well as to our colleagues? And so there's a number of principles that we might look at. We've reformed our policies to be anti-harassment and anti-discrimination. We've looked at being anti-racist in our organization, given the history of the United States in being very discriminatory to our African-American uh, membership and our physicians allocating our finances so that we focus more on this sort of work of being inclusive, uh, collecting data that will help inform our decisions. Because if we understand better what our rank and file in the organization is like, that will inform how our future will be. Uh, very important for us to look at our licensing, our accreditation, what are the barriers to people going into and advancing in their careers in medicine and how can we help with that? So change is both uh, toxic and tonic, as we say. So both danger and opportunity. So we have, if it's not only the threats that we will cease to exist as an organization, which we don't believe we will, because our membership continues to grow. We've had a 6% growth in the last year alone as a college, even though there's been a pandemic and we've not been able to be together because people view that need for us to be together as a fraternity. So we view this as an opportunity. We view this as an area that we can focus on and an opportunity for changing our behavior and for responding differently in the face of uncertainty as so many others eloquently alluded to, especially with this pandemic. And so the road lies long ahead. And as we journey forward, we continue to focus one day at a time on what lies ahead of us, recognizing that it's not today, but that it's uh, tomorrow, next week, next month, and the next five years that will really determine what our future lies, especially as we move 
from a transition from our current state into where we want to be, a relevant organization to the next generation, providing both academic content, providing collegiality in medicine, and providing a global framework where we all can work together. And so we say that to, for equity, when the whole world is vaccinated, then we will also all be free of this pandemic. And so we have been pushing our government hard to say, let us move our resources to parts of the world that need us so as to be able to make it a more equitable environment globally. I want to end with this little anecdote uh, to just remind us of uh, what our responsibility is. So this is 2021, the 50th anniversary of the Women's International Tennis Federation. 50 years ago, 10 women who you see pictured here, you might recognize Billie Jean King over in the corner here in the left. So 10 women who were at the peak of their careers as tennis uh, players quit the International Tennis Federation to form the Women's International Tennis Federation, primarily over gender pay parity the fact that their male counterparts were being paid much higher for playing the same game as the women were. And so on the 50th anniversary in New York, there was a special reception. They were given gold medals and they were fated. And one of them was asked, why is it that at the height of your career, they chose to jeopardize their career to go into something novel, recognizing they may never play again in competitive sports? And they said, we were asked to show up to stand up and to speak out. And so I would remind us that that's the responsibility of all of us as physicians. We show up for our patients, we stand up for them and for our profession, and we need to speak out against injustice, inequity, and to create a better world where all of us and our children can work together. And nobody could have said it better than Amanda Gorman, the young, woman poet laureate who was at President Biden's inauguration and said this poem and the, the one line that stands out is there's always light if only we are brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it. Thank you again for this wonderful opportunity for having joined you here today. I wish your conference every success. I want to invite all of you to the annual meeting in Chicago in the end of April. I hope as many of you as possible can come. I hope to meet each of you in person. Thank you again for your, for your love, your respect, and your fraternity. And I will end right here. Thank you so much.